I'm William Thomas, your conference director, and I'm here to welcome you to the beginning of our symposium on parenting and childhood. And I'm a member of the group of presenters for this, so I'm thrilled. And I'm, I'm just very happy, I was very happy to receive a presentation proposal from Donahue Shortridge, who I'd been really hoping would come back to speak at our annual conference. And so I think we're in for a treat here this morning. And uh, talking about uh, childhood development and the stages of childhood development from a Montessori perspective. Uh, Donahue um, ha has been an objectivist since 1969 and has been uh, studying Montessori education since 1980. She has um, American Montessori Society credentials in both infant and toddler and early childhood levels of education. So basically, she knows all about getting kids educated up until, mm, I guess, around 12, right? Something well, except that when you have a teenager, you know more, too. <laughs> yes. Well, teenagers are their own issue yeah, exactly. altogether. She holds a master's in humanities from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and she lectures at the Montessori Teacher Education Center in Boulder, and she travels around the U.S. and Canada uh, conducting staff development sessions and parent talks at Montessori schools. So it's wonderful having an expert like this with us, and please give a warm welcome to Donahue Shortridge. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Will, and thank you, attendees. I hope this will be a useful session for you. Um, I think that one of the greatest challenges in our culture today with regard to children is for us to come to understand the life of the child. We struggle with this because there are fewer children around, our elders have less experience with them, and the source of much of our information about children comes from the popular culture. But you know, it doesn't have to be this way. We can be parents, siblings, cousins, sisters, brothers, aunts, neighbors, teachers, whatever, but we can all create a path for children to become autonomous, fully functioning adults. And it's really actually quite simple, but it's not easy. There's a difference, as we know, about most endeavors. Most, the best endeavors usually are simple, but they're difficult to achieve. The, the, there's a few things we have to do. First of all, and even Ayn Rand says this, if you are choosing to be a parent or engaging with children in your world, you have to take it seriously. It's not just an add-on, it's a choice. And to then choose to do this, to choose to have children, or to choose to have them in their world, it requires a concomitant responsibility. And one of the responsibilities, first of all, is to valorize the child as an individual a person in the making. They are their own person, they are not an extension of us, they are not a reflection of us, maybe those are consequences, but that's not their purpose. Their purpose is to develop themselves and become a full-fledged person. And so we have to take some time to learn some things about child development, to learn some things about how children react in certain situations. We have to become observers of children, objective observers, to see what's really going on. It's real easy to make judgments and make, have prejudices about them but to really see them. But I think most significantly, it's about an attitude change. From viewing them as potted plants, which is a reference I heard at an earlier objectivist conference with regard to children. <laughs> I almost fell off my seat. But um, to, to shift from that reference to children to one in which we revere them, again, as people in the making. And that our role, in whatever capacity, whether it be parents, teachers, neighbors, relatives, whatever, with regard to children, is to have the honor of accompanying them and guiding them and learning from them ourselves what it is to be a great person. Choosing to, ch choosing to have children is a choice that we make. Choosing to not have children is also a choice. Both are valid. 
But again, once one decides to either have children or have them in our world, there is an obligation. And there's a responsibility that goes with that choice, as is true with all choices. There's a concomitant responsibility. And that is to raise them to competent adulthood. Anything less than that, as Rand says, is child abuse, in her way of saying that. So again, it's a choice with freedom and responsibilities that go with it. So look at Emma here. What do we need to do so that this child does develop autonomy? Well, first of all, she's two and a half here. Two and a half. Well, it actually wasn't even quite two and a half, almost two and a half. We honor her individual effort. No one helped her up on that split rail fence. She got up there all by herself. She chose it. And she was allowed the freedom to choose it. Also, no one rescued her. Those adults who were near her allowed her to fail, which would be to fall off or get stuck at this age. But it took her courage to get herself up there. One of the tenets that I like to talk about with parents is never put your child up on an apparatus that they then can't get down. Children do know, we do know in our bodies how far we can go. And so if we climb up, we can get down. But don't, so don't put your children up on something that they can't then themselves get down. So this is a, a metaphor for, or an example, of what it takes for young children to thrive. All right, so what does Rand say about children? Well, not a lot that I could find. I found a few examples, and I'm sure some of you know more, but one that I wanted to share with you was her 1962 radio broadcast, where she says that the child does depend on the adult but the adult has no right to abuse the child, that we are all endowed with natural rights of freedom to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but that the child is dependent on the adult for all his or her needs, starting you know, right, right away. Also in the 1974 Ford Forum talk, she said that, um, quote, the government, let's see, the government has to protect the child like any other citizen, but the child cannot claim for himself the rights of the adult simply because he's not able and he's not competent to exercise them. I know this is an ongoing discussion in objectivist circles, do children have the same rights as adults? And Ayn Rand says no. I would, of course, concur with that. They are developing, they are emerging rights along with responsibilities and competencies. Um, also in the Comprachicos, how do you pronounce that? Comprachicos, is that good? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Chapter in this, um, she says, quote, intelligence is the ability to deal with a broad range of abstractions. Whatever a child's natural endowment, the use of intelligence is an acquired skill. It has to be acquired by a child's own effort and automatized by his crucial, pro excuse me, by his own mind. But adults can help or hinder him in this crucial process. They can place him in an environment that provides him with evidence of a stable, consistent, intelligible world with challenges and rewards, his efforts, uh, that rewards his efforts to understand, or in an environment where nothing connects to anything Nothing holds long enough to grasp. Nothing is answered. Nothing is certain. Where, where it's the incomprehensible and the unpredictable lurks behind every corner and strikes him at any random step. So therefore, the adults can accelerate or hamper, retard, and perhaps the des uh, destroy the development of the conceptual faculty. So Ayn Rand says, yes, it's on a developmental continuum. So what does Dr. Montessori have to say about children? Is there anyone here who would like 
a, like a brief, who is Dr. Montessori? Does pretty much everybody know who Montessori is? Okay. Um, Dr. Montessori was a person, Dr. Maria Montessori. Her era was, uh, she was born in 1870 and died in 1952 in Italy. And she was a medical doctor, but her genius was observing young children and um, creating an educational pedagogy that supports the development of the individual. It was revolutionary at the time, it's revolutionary today. There are about 4,500 Montessori schools in America today, and many more, like 20,000 in the world. It's the largest, longest single pedagogy ever that still works. And uh, I ran, talked about it at length. Uh, Beatrice Hessen, I don't know if you remember or know about this, wrote an article back in 1970 on the Montessori method. So uh, Ayn Rand talked about Montessori a long time ago, and actually that's how I got into Montessori, was through objectivism. I was looking for an applicable approach to child rearing and education that was consistent with the individual. So what did Dr. Montessori have to say about the child? Well, she said many, many things. There are books and years of study, but I'll give you a brief abstract. She said that the child is the creator of the man he is to become, meaning that it's the child himself who does the work of his own development. The child is not a blank slate. And indeed, constructivist theorists that came after Montessori, Piaget, who was a protege of Montessori, by the way, concur with this view that the, ch that the child comes to the earth with what he or she has genes, personality, temperament, and then combines it with his or her engagement with the environment to fully create himself. It takes all of those components. And so what is the environment? That is the piece that is optional, that is creative, and that is where we all come in. She also said that this growth and development takes about 24 years to reach, the, takes about 24 years roughly for the child to reach maturity on a, a general statement. And that each of those, all of that development can be divided into four stages and we're gonna talk about that. But that the child is like a metamorphosis of an animal in that they are, they are the same person but as they evolve and change, they are different. But they, they're the same species, but that they, they evolve and change. And that that growth and development happens in its own time. And that each of us has our own experiences that have an effect on who we become. So each of us, because we're adults now, went through these stages. So we're gonna take a couple of minutes, if you are, would like to, and we're gonna do a little rewind into your own life. And it's just a quiet little moment, and I'm gonna ask you some questions. We're just gonna do a little rewind, and then that's gonna relate it to how we're gonna talk about child development. If you're uncomfortable with it, you don't have to, but if you would like to, it might be easier to just kinda of close your eyes as I ask you these questions. Now I see from some of you that you're not quite 24 yet, but that's okay, um, we'll talk about it anyway, and many of us have long passed that age. So we'll just, just assume where, where you are. All right, so <clears throat> take a breath. We're gonna start from roughly the ages of 21 to 24. What were you doing? Were you in school? Were you embarking on a career? Finding a mate? Were you, are you emancipated from your parents and creating your own domicile? What is or was your relationship with your parents at that time? What were you passionate about?
So now going back a little further, about 18 years to 21. Maybe you're just getting out of college or school or trade school or whatever you were doing after high school. What did you want to create for your life? How are you organizing your life? How are you organizing your life at this time? Because now you're on your own. You're, you're an adult at 18, roughly. Did you know how to earn money? Maybe you have some confusion or concern about the future? Who are your heroes? Okay, so travel back a little bit now into your adolescence, roughly your high school years, from puberty to graduating from high school, roughly. What kind of a teenager were you? What were you questioning? Do you have strong opinions about things? Are you political? How was high school? Do you have did you have a job? Who were your heroes? And who could you trust? And going back further to your kid years, let's say first grade or when your baby teeth fell out through to puberty, so roughly 6, 7 to 12, your childhood years. Did you have a bike? Did you go out? Go out and do things on your own? Stay out too late? Parents had to call you in? <laughs> what were you good at doing in your kid years? Did you have friends? What did you like to do with your friends? Do you remember stories of you and your parents? Maybe from pictures? Now going back further from six years old earlier is hard to remember because we have a different kind of mind under six than we do over six. But some, you probably have some snapshot memories of just different incidents or different smells or different moments, foods maybe, places. And there's certainly stories about you from the family lore and pictures of you. And which of the family stories that you heard or hear, you say, oh yeah, that's me. That was me then and it's me now. you remember anything about your parents from those years or your significant caregivers, the adults in your life. And when you're ready, you can come back to this space, take a breath. And so you can see how you were influenced by the people and events in your life to help shape who you were, who you are who you are becoming this is true for young children, too. Dr. Montessori had a brilliant analysis of this, which 
I think it's one of her greatest contributions. Okay, I'm gonna use the whiteboard over here, I'm sorry, and pretend this is one long whiteboard. <laughs> We're just gonna have to do it this way, because I don't have enough room, but we'll wing it. <clears throat> All right, this is what she called the constructive rhythm of life, and that it basically starts at zero, and I guess we could do dot, 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 back to conception, that's a whole other discussion, which we won't get into today all the way up to 24 years old, roughly. And then sometimes it takes some people longer to reach maturity, and that's fine. But she just generally was using this as a way to look at child development. So we're going to look at this, this trajectory to maturity over the rest of this session and the next session, section. And we're going to talk about what the needs and the tasks are of the child at each of these stages and what we can do as adults to support that so that they grow into full autonomous individual mature adults. That sound good? We good? All right. I think her insights are brilliant on this. I, I said, um, so she said, first of all, again, it takes 24 years and that, that each of the, at the 24 years are divided into four equal segments or planes of six years each. So here's the first one. And this is the, um, she called this the period of infancy. And we'll say from zero to six. You see, I'm sorry, over there. And then the second one, uh, so zero to six. And the second one goes from six to 12, and it's the period of childhood. And the third one is the period of 12, to 18, what's that called? Adolescence, yep, teenagers. <clears throat> and then 18 to 24 is the period of maturity. Interesting, she then divides each plane into two subparts that are really significant for us to understand how children change. She said that the most significant time in a young person's life, absolutely by far in their whole life, is from birth to three. This is where the most dramatic change happens ever in your life, from birth to three. There's so many neural connections going on, there's so many changes that never again in a person's life does so much dynamic change happen. <clears throat> And then, um, so it, this period peaks at three years old. Anybody have young children? Anybody here? How old? Five. Five? Okay. You're, okay, we'll talk about your child in a minute. From three, well, I mean your age child. <laughs> so from, from around three years old, there's, there's a shift in the way the child learns and acquires information and that has to do with two great um, acquisitions. The first one is uh, motor development. It's incredible, and I wish that I had my video up here. Maybe we can get it for the second section of, actually, you know what I'll do? I'll pass it around. I have a, I have a handout on it. It is so cool. <clears throat> this is a motor homunculus. It is so cool. It is taken from a neural cartographer, Dr. Wilder Penfield, and I have it written down here. And what he's talking about here is what the body would look like if the uh, volume of cerebral cortex was de developed to motor was um, the most significant. So you can see that the hands and the tongue and that, that motor development is the most significant part of development for the cerebral cortex. Actually, what we found, and I don't know if any of you were in my talk about, I don't know, three years ago on will development, but what we have found is that the uh, motor development and the cerebral development happen in the same part of the brain for young children. So what that means for us is they have to move. Our young children have to have the freedom to move, but move purposefully. 
And so the, the shift happens at three when they're able to kind of coordinate. They're no longer toddling. They're now sort of in control of themselves. And then the other big, big, big shift that happens at three is language development. Because now they can start to symbolize. Because they have these concrete experiences in their hand, and then somebody gives them the word for it, and the word for it represents the thing. And then later, that moves into abstractions where I don't even have to have this in my hand anymore. I can just think about it, write about it, read about it. We move into abstractions. But we first have to have these experiences. So from birth to three, we want to allow children to move and have lots of hands-on experiences. I like to say that young children need hands-on, three-dimensional reality at their developmental level. If when you're thinking about children, if you can just keep that in mind, children under six have to have hands-on three-dimensional experiences with the world so that later when they move into abstractions, they can re have it represented by something, a concept they know. If your only experience with the phenomena of the world is as represented in an iPad, you have no understanding of what it really is. That's my rant <laughs> about iPads are fine later, but not here. So then they're, okay, Ooh. I know, I know. It's hard. But this is why. And they also need very rich language. So they need words spoken to them by people who love them. And they need the names of the objects of the world expressed to them in a way that speaks to their heart. This is a horse. Not, oh, well, there's a horse. Because what they're figuring out is these objects that I'm seeing, feeling, experiencing, knowing has a name that's worthy of this object that I experienced through my senses. So that later, I have it anchored deeply. And I can represent it in all different kinds of ways later when I move into abstraction. So you spend a lot of time with little children talking to them. And you don't want to talk to them about abstract concepts. You want to name the universe for them. And you want to name it in a way that's honorable. Oh, flower, wildflower, pink wildflower. You don't talk exactly like that, but when they ask you what it is, you name it. And you put life in your voice so that they think it has a value. So you're showing them the value of the objects of the world by who you are and by how you express it to them. They also need eye contact. Little children need eye contact. You have to get down on their level. Otherwise, you're this big, hulking adult who's looking down on them, oppressing them, if you will. They need you to be face-to-face, eye-to-eye. And they need you to go slow. They can't move very fast. Or, well, here's what happens. You see this. Little children move fast because you're moving fast and they love you. And they will subordinate their own needs to you because they love you more. They, they have no power. So if we're really going to value the young person's life and who he or she is, we have to understand where they are developmentally and go slower. Does that make sense? Yes? Yes? We good? OK. So then <clears throat> this time from three to six is a time Dr. Montessori <laughs> talked about consolidation. Now they're not just learning with language, with regard to language. Now they're not just learning the names of the flowers. They're now wanting to know uh, pistil, stamen, leaf, stem, root. And they also want really, really, really big words like triceratops, <laughs> which is why I think so many five-year-olds love dinosaurs. <laughs> right? Stegosaurus. Big, big, big words. And they explode into reading and writing if given the opportunity. Uh, most uh, Montessori children are reading and writing by about four and a half. And it's just because they're so interested in reading and writing. And expressing themselves. 
And they're two separate uh, cognitive abilities. Reading is separate uh, from writing. And actually, writing comes before reading, because writing is a, a mus muscular control, and reading is more of an expressive, receptive, uh, decoding and encoding of sim symbols. Let's see, what else can I tell you about three to six? They're very, very interested in, at this age, they're very, very interested in grace and courtesy. Great time from three to six to introduce them to manners and how we do things. Please, thank you. Um, helping set the table, helping create order in one's life. Children of this age can be asked to do chores. And the chores can be very simple, but they can also be pre-math and pre-reading. Uh, do you know what the concept of one-to-one -one correspondence is? One-to-one -one correspondence is a pre-math concept where I have to figure out that the quantity is a reality. And the way we offer that to young children is to do things like, well, how many people are going to be at dinner today? Let's count. Well, there's mommy, there's daddy, there's sister, there's brother. How many plates do we need? Let's count. The whole idea of these kind of simple chores can help children get these concepts of one-to-one -one correspondence. That physical objects take up space. <laughs> A lot of young children, especially toddlers, don't even know that. They think that that's my chair, <laughs> even though you're sitting in it. And that's my hair, even though you, it's on your head. Because they have that cognitive development of a toddler, but once they move into three to six, they start to get it that each object of the world has a place. And that's why we create really orderly places for children of this age, so that they can see. You don't want to have a big jumble of in a toy box, because that's confusing. They can't see and understand and comprehend the phenomena that every object takes up a certain amount of space. So that's why we have objects on a shelf and some white space between the objects, so that it's easier for the eye to behold the whole of the physical object. They also need to have more purposeful movement. This is the time from three to six when they absolutely have to have time outside to play. Big, big, big important concept for children because they need to move their muscles and they need to have a way to do the uh, movement that's interesting to them and not interesting to us. They're not interested really at this point in getting from point A to point B. That comes later. What they're interested in is doing it over and over and over again. Have you ever noticed a child of this age round and round and round on the tricycle? Because they're interested in developing their muscles, improving this motor move, this motor uh, brain connection. So that's why they need pers uh, purposeful places to move. I'm seeing in the culture and in many schools right now where um, uh, boys especially are being reprimanded for movement and that many in the culture are equating quiet and silent with good and that's suppressing the nature of the young child. You know, you can ask yourself, did that happen to you? Where somebody told me to sit down and shut up when all I wanted to do was move and run. So we have to allow that for them and provide those places for them. And there, in my judgment, there is no more important place to do that than outside, in ungroomed nature, if possible. Because they can discover the undulations of the hillock by putting their body and their feet on it. Oh, there's an incline here. I'm going to have to figure out how to do that. There's a big fence here. What am I going to do? and that the mind and the body and the brain and the muscles all work together. And there's this great satisfaction the child has in accomplishing this. So in, this first, in the first plane, from birth to six, the, the main task is for the child to construct himself physically. 
It's very internal, the development. Think about a baby and think about a six-year-old. How much has happened? Learning to walk. Learning to, uh, let's say, skip, hop, jump, walk backwards, ride a trike, jump on a mini tramp. From birth, from just laying there, all the way to that kind of movement. Where have they gone in their language development? From babbling and cooing to, talk, to talking to you in complex, flooded out sentences and paragraphs and stories, right? The other part that's really important at this stage is what we call order. And order, as I mentioned a little bit earlier about why we have simple objects for them, is that they're trying to order their internal systems by the external order of the world. And the kinds of order they need are, first of all, they need temporal order. What comes next? So that's why we offer young children routines. First we do this, then we do this, then we do this, so that they can start to trust it. Not necessarily that every day at 9 o'clock we do one thing, but this, then this, then this, so they can come to trust it. <clears throat> uh, sensory order. Opportunities to manipulate the objects of the world so they can take it in sensorially. And we in Montessori say it's experience before language. We give young children lots of opportunities to manipulate objects before we put the language to it, because that's a semi-abstract representation of the object. The other thing that they need is social order, which is who are the people in my world, which is why we have to, for young children, we don't want to expose them to too many adult activities, too many of people they don't know, too many, you know, at the mall too much or out there because they can't figure out who's who. They're still, young children are still trying to figure out that I'm not mommy. And that individuation begins very, very early. And that, that toddler stage where their no and me and mine is that attempt to discern myself from the other and from the others. And so we offer them simple, um, consistent people. So you want to have few caregivers and you want to have people around them they know rather than people coming in and out and a jumble and it's really chaotic for children. It's very difficult. <clears throat> and then spatial order, as I said earlier, is about where objects are in space. If the chair is over here, then I must be over here. These are all things you say, well, don't we all get that? Well, you'll see when we move into the second and the third and the fourth plane why this part is the foundation, is the fundamental. So it takes a special kind of person to be with children of this age. If any of you are thinking about working with infants and toddlers, it's an incredible joy and delight, but it takes a certain kind of person who can move slowly, who can use simple words, who's very patient, and who sees the development of the person. Because what you get is you get to see that right before your eyes. You get to see their aha moments. Oh, <coughs> I see this is over here, and this is over here, and I'm over here. And they get to know that the world is a rational, knowable place. Very, very early if we provide it for them. Later, as you'll see, they begin to <coughs> order it and create it for themselves. But for right now, in this time, we set the foundation so that they have it imprinted with them and that the adults are people that they trust and love. Maybe that happened for you and maybe it didn't. Maybe you don't remember. <clears throat> Some of us who grew up in chaotic households turn in to be super neatniks <laughs> or we're a mess ourselves. One of the things that children are learning at this stage in the regard to order is that everything has a beginning, a middle, and an end. You know, when we're first coming onto the earth, <clears throat> the first thing we do is the second thing. We just do things, usually put it in our mouth, put it in our hands, just engage. And the second thing we learn is the first part, how to go get something, how to initiate, how to start something. So we learn how to start something, how to do it, 
And then the third thing we learn is how to clean it up and put it away and complete the cycle. So one of the family rules in your house could be with children of this age is in our house we always put our toys or our activities away before we get out the next thing. And believe me, children from three to six are really, really interested in this. They want to know. They want to know what the rules are. And they want to comply because they love you. And it speaks to their internal order sensitivity. They're interested in what that internal order is. <clears throat> OK. Then uh, just to give you a hint of what comes next, and we'll talk about these next three, the second session, is as they move towards six, they start to have a shift in the way they think and what they're interested in. Their thinking is more linear. It doesn't have to be so tied to the concrete. They're more interested in semi-abstractions and abstractions. And they start to um, be more social with their friends. And they want to make up the rules. There's a lot of rule making that goes on in childhood. I want to know what the rules are. So we'll, we'll talk about that more next time. So for now, um, any questions, comments, discussion on childhood, children, parenting? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Steve Patterson. I had a question in regards to autism yes. and infancy and how, they, how yes. Montessori handles that. OK, well, it depends on where they are on the spectrum. Uh, autism is a spectrum. And there's mild autism all the way to severe autism. Um, if the Montessori guide is aware of what the peculiarities of the autistic child are, they're usually able to help to assist and be of service to that child. It depends on how severe it is, how trained the Montessorian is, and how many autistic children he or she is to receive in her classroom. One of the things we're finding is that with Montessori moving into the public schools, the school has lost the autonomy and the ability to decide how many children we can serve. And so some public schools are receiving up to 20% children with special needs, and they just can't handle it. But mildly autistic children pretty much do really well if you know what their needs are. And they're not going to be so social. But they're going to have um, fascinations with certain things. And if we understand that and know that and have what we can uh, serve them, it does really well. One of the things we're finding is that um, special needs professionals come into a Montessori classroom and say, you have all the diagnostic tools right here. Because it's multi-sensory, it's multi-dimensional. The, pers the um, perspective is of freedom of the child to choose. And that's what most autistic children need, is to be seen and loved and opportunity to move at their own pace. So if, if that's your situation, you want to really check out the school, see if they can serve your child, or if, you know, if they have the capacity to, to take care of that. OK, yes, sir. Larry Borland, University of Pittsburgh. Com uh, I'm a pediatrician in Tennessee, oh, too. Great. But comment on the, the method as a preventive measure for autism. And I, I realize that that's not a total cover. The one specific example I can think of in regard to lack of contact and human intervention is the Romanian children who yes. were put in basically were hospital beds with no real, what you and I would consider. Right human contact, right. even though they were cared for. Yes. Um, does anybody, everybody know about the Romanian orphan children? Um, quickly, the, the Romanian orphan children, as he said, were left to be in cribs. They, you know, they were fed, but they pretty much weren't given the nurturing they need. Interestingly, Dr. Montessori had a similar background. She worked in, at that time, it was called the Hospital for Idiots. And that's the word they used at that time. But they put in insane people along with developmentally delayed people. And so it was, you know, can you imagine the chaos? And what she discovered with the developmentally delayed children was that they were able to improve their situation because of the hands-on materials that they were afforded when she intervened and provided them for them. So what they need are things to do that draw their interest. And they need a place where they are seen and honored for who they are. Now, as far as medically, I don't feel 
qualified to speak about that. You probably know more than I do. But I do know that the multi-sensory approach, in other words, there's opportunities for the child to choose his or her activity, and it can be, audit um, it can be aimed at auditory, visual, gustatory, olfactory. Think olfactory, there's five. Anyway, there's all of these materials that are, can speak to a child's need, and what we find is children go to the work or the activity that they need for their development. It's amazing. And you see children doing it over and over and over again because they know that's what they need. It's incredible. I mean, we do that too as, as full-grown people. So that, yeah, so her, her experience early was with children like that, and that's how she developed her system, was based on her observing that. Yeah. Hi, Heather Wagonhalls, and Hi. I wanted to know what uh, amount of emotion and patterning, like in the, in the, in the sense of, of a value system evolving towards pleasure away from pain, how much in this zero to six or zero to three, or if it's different from zero to three to zero to six, that as we're storing and, and, and starting to experience emotion in response to, you know, oh, like the, the cat scratched me because I pulled right. his tail kind right. of stuff. Right. It, are we assigning that emotion and are we carving those kind of behaviors in and, oh, don't do that at this point? Or? Is to, into Montessori or to parenting of this age, ideal parenting of this age? Yeah. Okay. And, and does Montessori have a specific approach to that? Yeah. Okay. So what the, the um, I would say what it is, is has to do with two factors. One is development of self-esteem and the other is the development of the will. And what happens is that the development of self-esteem, there's two components to it. And one is that I'm seen for a person on the earth, I'm allowed to be here, I, I know I have a right, and I'm seen for my own person. And the second piece is competency, competency, the ability to do for myself. And that joy and that happiness comes from the experience of, oh, I can get myself together, I can do, and then they look around for somebody else to be nice to. And so the the pleasure pain response is is in a is consistent with the development in other words it's not outrageous in other words it's not outside of the norm it goes along with normal development so when you when you um, put your hand in the hot water or the cat scratches you you say oh that's how that feels but nobody gets hysterical and nobody goes crazy what it is is that we reflect back to the child what that felt like so that the child owns the feeling, whether it's compassion for their friend because they've done something well themselves, and you, can, you know this happens to you too. You, oh, you accomplish something and you look around, you say, okay, you know, I'm ready to be social. Or if something hurts, you say, well, you know, that hurt, but that's okay, because I'm, I'm okay. So that sense of I'm okay enables whatever comes our way to be handled. In other words, it gives us grit and resilience very early on. And then will development is, this, is, a, is a sister to that, and that has to do with I will go as far as I can, and I will be given freedom to move as far as I can to, my autonom to be my autonomous self, and I will develop it along the way on a natural trajectory. And so that will development says, oh, okay, well, I can decide not to touch that hot stove. Or I know that cat might scratch me, so I'm going to move away from it. Or I know that whatever, I can't get down off of this fence so I won't climb up there. Or I think I can, so I will. So it's about coming to the place of choosing. And then that is the, the consequence of that is how the emotions form. Once I have a hold of who I am, Emotions can be part of that development of self. Does that make sense? Okay. Other questions, comments, discussion? Yes, sir. So I'm trying to, to formulate this beyond just an anecdotal story with my own self. Oh, those are great. But I'll take an anecdotal story. Well, one of the things I've noticed now is, along with the sort of rule formation, right, because the, the rule formation, making the rules. Oh, rule formation, yes. Because uh -huh. he'll do that with... Yeah. Uh, well, I only do that on Tuesdays. 
You know, so he, make, he makes these rules about that to generalize from one instance of wanting to do something or not wanting to do something. Okay, Sammy, today's your day to feed the dog. Uh -huh. I only do that on, on oh. Tuesdays when it's sunny out or so, just uh -huh. these random rules. Yes. Um, so and I, I he's was five? He's five. Okay. And he's been doing that for a couple months. He's moving here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering how that fits into the rulemaking and, and other things. The other aspect of that is in terms of choice, also choosing to test and push those boundaries. Uh, and yes. so here's, here's a rule, you know, this is not yes. something you're supposed to do, yes. you know, and really going out of his way to choose not to obey that, that rule. And it, is that part of the autonomous development as well, or is he just being a pain in the butt? That is a great question. And that, <laughs> those have to do with development of the will, and the child needs to know where the fence is. And the fence is the adult giving the child limits till he can handle himself more. So for example, back to the I only do that on Tuesdays, um, what they, they will, so, okay back up. A lot of times young children test those rules because they are wanting to know what the power of words are. And they want to know if my words can move mountains. <laughs> and you're the mountain, you're the dad. And you, what you do is you pretty much don't negotiate that which is not negotiable. <laughs> And so you really, the, my suggestion for that is you just, you just shrug and don't really give them a lot of eye contact. And then you say something like, when the dog is fed, then you may go outside. Or something else where there's no choice. You're making it real clear there's no choice, but you're not going to get into it with him. But it sounds like he's interested now in how language shifts to socialization with dad or mom or anybody else. And they are going to, and we'll talk about this this afternoon, they get into way deep rulemaking at this time. And he sounds like he's, he's headed there. Um, so after the Tuesdays, and what was the second one? The what? That, that was just part of the rule. It was, it was the pushing of the boundaries. Oh, yeah, pushing the, the boundaries. Yeah, they, they will push the boundaries. And what they want to know, what children, OK, children want to know there's a fence. They want to know there's somebody in charge. Because what happens when there's nobody in charge, the um, um, anarchist parents, you know, you know, that kind of parent where, oh, well, hey, whatever. The children get afraid because they say to themselves, I'm four years old and I'm in charge. I, I, can't, I can't even climb this, this, this ladder, this fence. I can't be in charge. So they get afraid. So what they really want to know is, where's the boundary? And so the parent's job or the caregiver's job is to figure out what those boundaries are and present them to the child in a rational, calm way and not a punitive way. But I love the sentence stem, in our house we. In our house, the parents decide when the children go to bed. In our house, we always feed the dog every morning before we go to school. Or whatever the rules are, you set it up in a way that everybody contributes, which, by the way, is another piece that you start here. Everybody contributes. Everybody has chores. In our family, we all do our chores before we fill in the blank, whatever. And if you set that up and you model it, children get it. However, they will try to test those boundaries. They want to know if you really mean it, if you're consistent. And that's sometimes the hard part, because they always know when you're vulnerable. When you're tired, or you're busy, or you have to go somewhere right now, that's when they test you. Because they want to see, do you, are you consistent? And that's what they're looking for, that consistent response. Good question. OK, what else? <clears throat> well, um, this afternoon, like I said, we'll get into what happens in, in childhood, in adolescence, and then moving into maturity, and emancipating from our parents, and becoming out on our own. So thank you for this morning, and I'll see you this afternoon. We'll see if we can work on these videos, because I have some great clips to show you. Thank you.